opening the lid of the coffee pot, picking up a tiny item, grasping a flat object such as a piece of paper. People with disabilities can easily complete those tasks with this electronic arm. Mình bị mất cánh tay của mình năm 1 tuổi do một tai nạn y tế mất vô cần đã làm thay đổi mình rất là nhiều. Tặng mắt thấy những người dùng họ sử dụng cánh tay thì lúc đó mình rất là tự hào khi mình đã được cống hiến, góp thêm giá trị để họ có thể sống có cuộc sống tốt hơn. We're very proud to be a Vietnamese company. What we built here would be very difficult to achieve anywhere else. The talent that's available here, the open-mindedness of the people, also they're quite aspirational. We want to bring prosthetic assistance to every amputee in Vietnam and beyond. Making affordable robotic prosthetics for amputees in Vietnam and other developing nations is the ultimate goal of our guest today and his associates. They are realizing that ambition with the pride of their own Make in Vietnam products. Thank you, Raphael Masters, for joining us on Talk Vietnam and share with our audience about such an amazing journey. Well, welcome to Talk Vietnam, Raphael. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Mm. This is your first time on Talk Vietnam. Yes. How are you doing? Nervous, but so far so good. Mm. So uh, my first question uh, is, how did you come up with uh, uh, the idea of opening up a startup focusing on uh, making affordable uh, robotic uh, prosthetics? Um, I guess there are a couple of things that uh, inspired this. Um, one is that I grew up in the UK, next to the biggest disabled college in the country. So most of my teenage friends were in wheelchairs and very dependent on technology to live. Mm -hmm. So I've always had a very keen idea of what this technology should be able to do and what kind of support these people need. And then when I came to Vietnam, um, I saw a, a big space in the market. In the West, you have more uh, subsidies and support for these kinds of products, but there's Nothing like that in emerging markets. There's no kind of infrastructure. So yeah, I just decided that I was going to do it. You need to build what people need, not what you wish they needed. Okay. And that's something that I really wanted to do in Vulcan, like think about how we would scale and, and build a big company from day one. So is there any competition you saw in, in this very niche market? Yeah, there are quite a few different companies that um, are trying to build prosthetic hands and feet. But one of the, okay, so the big deep dark secret of prosthetics is it's actually fairly easy to make a prosthetic hand. I mean, a 3D printer, $1,000 in three weeks, and literally anyone can build a, a fancy bionic hand. Mm. But the problem then is you've made one, well done. How are you going to make 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000? Mm. And then how are you going to distribute these? How are you going to maintain them for the next 40 years? And you can't have like hundreds of 3D printers all over the world and managing hundreds of thousands of files. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we decided early on we were going to do different. Like we built for scalability from day one. Mm -hmm. And we also had a, a wider focus because it's a very intensive process to get a prosthetic. It, it's lots of time and effort and manual labor. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to also build the sensor technology so that it was faster for people to just put it on and immediately start using it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the key differentiators we have. So normally it takes you four years for a, a Medtech product to go through design uh, phase and then another two years to get into the market. But Vulcan did it in two and a half years, I believe. Actually, in, we fitted our first user in about a month. Mm. Um, so when we started Vulcan, the first thing we did was uh, exactly what I said before. We downloaded a 3D printed hand, and we, we sort of printed it out. We tested if it would work with these kinds of sensors. Mm -hmm. And then we immediately recruited our first amputee, Duke. And um, the first sort of design that we iterated on was, was one month later, and it was incredibly ugly and crude and basic. Mm -hmm. But we just put it on him and got some sort of good data back and, and learned how to improve the product um, and we followed that pattern for the first two years or so we we had a new sort of version out every two or three months and we were able to do this because 
we had a super motivated engineering team, but we also had Luke who was there to wear it, test it, and give us a lot of feedback. So we were able to really cut down the, the time for R&D. Um, I think also the fact that we weren't overly dependent on like 3D printing for manufacture in the long run was an advantage. Mm. We certainly 3D printed in the early days and it, it helps for prototyping. But the fact that we were designing something that could scale out and use other materials meant we could get to market faster. Um, one other advantage we had actually was, um, so we were connected with uh, MOST, the Ministry of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. And we got support through Project 844, mm. I think it was. Um, and so they, they helped us get things like uh, ISOs and um, certification and, and medical registration. So that also like, helped accelerate things quite a bit. Founded in 2018, Vulcan Almetics is a startup project that creates affordable modular prosthetic hands that are easily removable and functional in everyday life. We are making affordable modular robotic prosthetics for developing nations. Our prosthetics can be maintained remotely and there is a wide range of tools, modules and accessories that are available online or can be 3D printed with any 3D printer. We truly believe that mobility is for everyone. It shouldn't be a question of economics. When you see your users being able to play guitar, doing push-up, wearing your product, you know that every single effort is being rewarded in the most magical and meaningful way. Models imported from abroad can open and close, but some have wrists which cannot rotate. As for Vulcan's model, it can rotate 360 degrees and can be held at any angle. To produce quality prosthetic arms, Vulcan has cooperated with technicians and orthopedic centers to create optimal comfort for users. Qua một thời gian tương đối là ngắn, tôi thấy là ngu cần liên tục người ta nghiên cứu, thay đổi, phát triển ra những cái sản phẩm tiếp cận gần với lại bệnh nhân hơn. Mẫu mã cũng đẹp hơn. Cái giá thành nó tương đối hợp lý ở cái thị trường Việt Nam. Vulcan Augmentics combines a traditional metal frame with 3D printed plastic parts. Vulcan also works with NGOs, charities and community foundations to provide people living with disabilities with their first prosthetic hand or pair of hands free of charge. And the young engineers at your company, um, the Vietnamese uh, ones, uh, yeah. are in charge of the uh, R&D for software development of the product, right? Well, I mean, I'm the CEO. I'd like to say I'm in charge, but uh, <laughs> yes, yes, it's them. So for talents like that, how did you recruit them? Well, we're really lucky in that um, we are a deep tech company that has uh, positive social impact as by default, like almost as a side effect. Mm. And when engineers come to Vulcan, I think what draws them is um, engineers, they love to make products uh, that they are proud of and they like to see those products used in the market. They like to make things that they can see make a difference. Mm. And when they work at one of the larger companies, there are quite a few of them um, here. I mean, there's, you know, Siemens, Bosch, Samsung, whatever. Right. You go to one of these and they've got 100,000 engineers working for them. Right. And you're just one guy in a cubicle designing one tiny widget that nobody will ever see. Well, we've actually found that, um, so for people to hire away an engineer from Vulcan, we found it takes an average of three to four times our salary to actually get them to walk out the door. And on at least one occasion, we've had engineers who have got offers from these larger companies with a much higher salary. They spent a few months there and they've decided that, no, they want to come back to Vulcan. And we're quite accepting of that because we, we hire a lot of our engineers quite young. Um, we, we have a very strong internship program. We get students and we take on top talent. We, we give them huge scope to grow. Um, and that tends to mean that they'll, they'll stay with us uh, much, much longer and we build up in-house talent. Yeah, right. Uh, so what are the vision and uh, mission that Vulcan Augmentics is pursuing? Um, that's a really difficult one because it's, it's very hard to express simply, but I think, so I'll, I'll try and do it in a narrative form, I guess. So at the moment, um, 
losing a limb is a, a horrific, traumatic, life-changing event. You know, you'll, you'll wake up in hospital, you'll look down and your arm is gone. Mm. And immediately you're thinking like, oh my God, what do I do? How, how am I gonna work? How am I gonna take care of my family? How am I gonna get a family or a wife? Who's gonna love me like this? I'm, I'm totally broken. Yeah. And most people will spend like up to two years just Recovery. hiding away. Yeah. and sort of grieving and, and recovering. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll know that Vulcan has succeeded when you wake up, you look down and your arm's gone and you just think, ah, oh, damn, I'm gonna have to take two weeks off work to sort this out. Mm -hmm. Like when it becomes an inconvenience, that's I think when we'll have succeeded. I want to build a company where people should feel safer and more confident just knowing that Vulcan exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful vision that you set for the company. Um, you mentioned that uh, people uh, who maybe, I mean, 70% of your clients, uh, I, un I understand, um, usually they lost their part of their bodies, arms or legs, due to accident. And usually they are laborers, right? Um, yeah, and, we and see um, a lot of a lot of factory workers factory and a uh, surprising number of engineers, electrical engineers especially. Um, that's industrialization is the primary driver of uh, amputation in like emerging economies. If you look over at the West, then you you start to see things like um, diabetes, cancer, and chronic diseases have an impact. But over here, yeah, it's still industrialization. One of the one of the biggest misconceptions we still get when we tell people that we sort of do prosthetics and we're in Vietnam, everyone always starts talking about the war. And the war. Oh, okay. yeah, and like that's, veterans issue. And, yeah, and yeah. we like we still do see occasional um, occasional uh, amputees come in who have like picked up war ordnance and, and it's exploded and hurt them. It's like a little bit annoying having to constantly correct that preconception like when people hear Vietnam they just think oh the war and it's right. it's like no it, it's all about the con the country is growing yeah. and yeah industrialization you're seeing more people um, more factories cropping up you're seeing more people driving around on on motorbikes you're seeing like an increasing level of wealth and it's um, yeah it's just very different drivers to what people would assume right so accidents uh, at work and and, and stuff yeah. like that Opening the lid of the coffee pot. Picking up a tiny item. Grasping a flat object, such as a piece of paper. People with disabilities can now easily complete these tasks with Vulcan's artificial arm, which uses sensor to read muscle movements and is used like an armband. Trên tay tôi là cái vòng cảm biến à, sử dụng à, sóng cơ và đưa lên lắp ở vị trí trên cánh tay thì tôi thấy là tiện nghi hơn, dễ điều khiển hơn. Và tay điện thì thiết kế mô đun cho nên là là cái việc mà để lắp ráp mang một cái tay, bệnh nhân tự mang một cái tay là rất nhanh. Tôi nghĩ là chỉ cần 5 10 giây là có thể lắp ráp được một cái tay của vô cần. Và khi sử dụng sóng cơ thì cái điều khiển ấy, nó sẽ linh hoạt hơn. This bracelet reads signals from the user's muscles. It sends instruction to the electronic hand to help the user gain a better fine motor control. This is one of the things that makes the Vulcan electronic arm different. But very few people know that Vietnamese engineers and designers are behind manufacturing this arm. Trung, chúng tôi cho phép mình tập trung tập trung trực tiếp vào chỉ làm về cái cái vòng điện cơ thôi. Đó sau đấy mình xong hoàn thành xong vòng điện cơ thì mình sẽ kết nối cái cái vòng đó tới cái tay. Mọi người thấy là nó hiệu quả. Đó mọi xong rồi mọi người sẽ chấp nhận nó, bắt đầu xây dựng nó thành rồi đó. Về đầu tiên là vui và tự hào thì tất cả những gì mình làm. Thứ hai là cũng một phần là cảm ơn công ty đã hỗ trợ rất nhiều để mình hoàn thành được cái cái ý tưởng đó. Công việc chính đó là mình sẽ thiết kế À, thiết kế 3D à, lên các bản vẽ à, tính toán các à, kết cấu cho cái tay để phù hợp với người sử dụng rồi à, sau đó là mình tham gia mình làm các sản phẩm mẫu để kiểm tra lại các thiết kế đó nó có phù hợp với người dùng hay không về xã hội thì mình tự hào mình, mình đã đóng góp được một sản phẩm rất là ý nghĩa cho những người khuyết tật để giúp họ à, có thể hòa nhập lại với cộng đồng dễ dàng hơn, tạo ra thêm được nhiều công việc hoặc có thể cầm nắm các vật. 
Previously, Falcon Automatics only had five staff, but now it has over 30 on the payroll. Of this number, only Raphael Masters is from England, and the remaining team members are from Vietnam. Falcon Automatics believes that Vietnamese intelligence will produce meaningful value for Vietnamese people. What do you think about the uh, current uh, labor force in Vietnam in high-tech industries? I find them quite impressive. Um, actually, I've, I just came back uh, from a business trip to Singapore and I was talking to other startup founders there who have spent time in Vietnam and they made the same comment, which is that Vietnamese just get things done. Um, actually, one of, my, okay, one of my most inspiring and favorite pictures of this country, there are a few different examples that I love, but the, the all-time one for me that expresses the Vietnamese attitude to challenge, um, there's a picture from the, the American War, and it's a bunch of doctors in their full sort of scrubs and nurses, and they are in a swamp. They're in a mangrove swamp, mm. up to their knees in water, and uh, a soldier is being wheeled into them to have um, open chest surgery. And so like this is, they set up an entire surgical team, mm. not just out in the jungle, but knee deep in a swamp using coconuts for IV drips. And people who can do that can accomplish anything. I mean, th there's another example. Um, a few years ago, there was a farmer and he wanted a helicopter. Mm. And of course you can't buy them here. So, so he made one. one. Like, yeah, I've, I've just found that if, if Vietnamese people want to do something and, and sort of they're, they're determined, they'll just make it and do it and they'll, the engine, the way that they engineer is they will find um, incredibly simple and robust ways to do things that in other countries or in other engineering systems mm -hmm. would be a lot more complex and expensive. Right. I think that's one of my yeah, favorite things about being in Vietnam and like seeing how people act here. Yeah, I see. You know, sometimes the resources are limited, so they have to be creative in order yeah. to get things done. Yeah. Um, what do you think, uh, what are the challenges or the potential that uh, they have? So I think Vietnam as an economy is going to just continue growing and present more and more opportunities. You're going to see more investment from more advanced engineering firms. Um, Apple uh, are opening a factory here. Um, mm -hmm. It's not totally to do with engineering, but Lego are also building a factory here, which is just exciting for me. Yeah. Um, so I think the potential is there for Vietnam to become like uh, definitely in sort of the top Ten in the world in terms of engineering and technical capability. They just have to sort of want it enough and go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of challenges, um, I think sometimes Vietnamese see their country a little bit more negatively than they should. Mm. I think sometimes they will, they will look at Vietnam and say, oh no, we're just Vietnam. We're not that high. We're not that good yet. We're not that sort of advanced yet. Okay. And that mindset can sometimes hold them back. Right. And um, I think once you can get them to overcome that and see that, that that's, it's just image, you know, right. there's, there's huge potential here. It's not about how advanced you think your country is. It, it's not about sort of, do you have like robots zooming around on the street like in San Francisco? It's about what you can accomplish and achieve and build yourself. Right. And that's pretty much anything. Yeah. Human capital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, what makes you and your team uh, most proud of when talking about your product? I think that just when you see the users get it, um, one of the problems that we have dealing with amputees in Vietnam is that, well, and across the world actually, especially if they're, they're lower income, they don't believe that they can get this technology. They think this technology is too fancy for them and that they, they can't afford it and they can't use it and it's not right for them. And when they, when they come in for a fitting session and you put it on and it just works for them and it's at a price point that they know they can afford and like, wow, this is something I can actually have and it just works and you see the look on their face, mm -hmm. like that is absolutely incredible. Like that's the moment that I think um, motivates the team more than anything. Mm. What about um, the make in Vietnam? Um like yeah, approach? I mean, the, the whole product is made in Vietnam. Um, the one exception right now is the the circuit boards, we have to order them from China just because um, at the moment there are companies in Vietnam that can do uh, PCBs, these circuit boards, but they'll only do really large orders. They don't have the automated systems to be able to take in smaller orders yet. Yeah. Eventually that's going to switch back to Vietnam and everything else is made here and that's something we're quite 
proud of. We don't need to um, like outsource it to other countries. It's a totally Vietnamese product, a Vietnamese brand, and that's something that we really want to bring to the world. I mean, I mentioned before that um, it's an aspirational country. They could be anything they want to be. And one of the things we want to do with Vulcan is show that like, Vietnam can deliver high-end technology, a full solution. The World Health Organization, WHO, estimated that today, globally, 2.5 billion people need assistive technology. Therefore, there are 2.5 billion proficient users of wearable and body-mounted devices. When supported with technology and auxiliary products to replace lost limbs, they can easily do an array of tasks, such as push-ups, driving, serving tables, online selling, cooking, and so on. Instead of feeling like a burden, they can now create value for themselves and society. So, um, you said this more than once, that um, you are proud to say you are a Vietnamese company. Yeah. And uh, your products serve Vietnamese people with disabilities, with limited uh, finances. So, um, do you aim to go global? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, like, we, we don't just want to stay a local company. This product is going to work for people all over the world. And the sensor technology especially, it can be used for prosthetics, it can be used for assistive devices, it can be used for clinical trials, it can be used for sports science rehabilitation. Any time that you actually want to get a real measurement of the human body and take in meaningful data, mm -hmm. our sensors can do that. And they can sort of interpret that and give you results. They can, you can't, it's not just about prosthetics, they use Bluetooth, so you can put on our sensor and control your iPad. Mm. I mean, the, the other day, this is exactly what our main tester Luke was doing he took off his arm and he was just playing fruit ninja just waving it around and sort of hacking things in front of his ipad and that's that that is a technology that has truly global uh, cross industry potential and that's one of the reasons why we're quite confident that um we can make vietnam sort of a global brand in terms of this technology yeah but uh, why did you choose to do this in vietnam in the first place and then export the products to different countries um I'm, I'm sure there's probably a, a better answer than this, but what it really comes down to is I was here, I saw the need, I saw the opportunity, mm. and I saw that there were the resources and people here that could do it. Mm. I mean, if I tried to do the same thing in the West, um, it would cost about 10 times as much, it would take two times as long, we'd have to deal with uh, a lot more challenges in terms of regulation, and also other big industry players trying to desperately protect their area. But they're not here. They're not in emerging economies serving people where there's, there's a lower healthcare infrastructure level. They just can't do that. Mm. And so that's sort of what we think is one of our major advantages. We can. Yeah. So how do you think the product would talk about, I mean, uh, represent Vietnam? Well, if you know that it's a Vulcan product, you're going to know that Vulcan is a Vietnamese company. I mean, it's, um, it's something where very proud of and upfront about is something that's in all of our media. So if you've got that product, you're going to know where it's from. Um, we've actually just we've actually got our first uh, large scale order into India. We're going to be shipping 300 units starting in January next year. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually going to find out very literally. We're going to find out the answer to this question in 2024. Okay. Well, congratulations for the order. Thank you. Today. Top Vietnam visited the office of Vulcan Optics in Ho Chi Minh City. Here, CEO Rafael shared a fascinating insight into the prosthetic arm manufactured by his company. What is it in here? So this is our latest product. It's hand. I'll be very happy to show it. Mm -hmm. A 3D printed TPU socket. Mm -hmm. And we have the latest Vulcan hand. The hand also has some extra modules and attachments for specific tasks. Mm -hmm. So an example would be this one, which is for lifting heavy weights or um, cylindrical objects. And we have mm -hmm. another one which is designed if you want to be a waiter. So mm -hmm. this will let you put this on, go in and start doing a job and earning money. Mm -hmm. And one of the unique selling points of Vulcan, something that's quite special, is our control system. Okay. Um, most companies will have sensors and controls that you build into the socket, but ours is a simple armband, and mm -hmm. you can put this on. And can I try it on? 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'll, I'll talk you through it in a second. Right. Uh, the big difference there is that with the traditional method of putting sensors in here, it will take you up to two months to really learn and acclimatize. Mm -hmm. With this, it's less than two minutes. Wow. So we'll do a very How much quick... time you can cut short? Yes, yeah. a lot. Um, it cuts down on the, the recovery time, the rehabilitation time. Okay, so if you would just like to put this on, um, uh, we'll turn this on. Our product comes with an app. Mm, so you have to download the app. Yes, every user will get the app. You'll pair it with this device. So this is reading your muscles right now. So if you tense your arm, should do. You can see the uh, it's moving up and down slightly. So tense a bit more, as strong as you can. Okay, yeah. yes. Now I'll turn on the hand and it will automatically connect. Now it's turning green. Okay, and it will change to blue again in a second. And release. And tense again. <gasps> Magic! <laughs> yeah, and tense again. Okay. Yay! There you go. Normally it's about five minutes in total compared to like six hours for the normal process. Okay, okay. We also give our users um, one of these as a backup. So this, they both connect with Bluetooth and if something goes wrong with this, there are a couple of buttons they plug into here and they can just do it all manually. So we believe in, yeah, backups upon backups mm. and everything should be modular and easy for the user to control, assemble and change. Right. So what makes your product uh, different from other... Uh, I'd say the biggest difference um, is our approach to sensors. Mm -hmm. And we use uh, machine learning pattern recognition software. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the deep tech side, um, it's all about the control software. Can we call it a Make in Vietnam product? Yes, we absolutely can. Um, it's the only thing that's not from Vietnam is some of the circuit boards. And I'm quite confident that probably within five years, that's going to be an option for us here. Mm -hmm. um, one other, yeah, a few other things that we do locally is the, the frame is made locally, everything is printed locally, but most importantly, I think, it's Vietnamese designers and engineers and product developers have contributed to this. So talking about uh, different uh, generation of the product, mm -hmm. uh, you are now uh, have developed the fifth uh, generation of your product, right? No, we're on our ninth generation of ninth. prosthetic and we're on our fourth generation of sensor. Mm, okay, so um, what are you heading to in terms of a product development? Um, in the next year, we want to uh, improve our sensor technology. So right now it uses uh, EMG sensors. We want to expand that to include optical or PPG sensors, um, motion tracking, um, BCGs. Uh, essentially, we want to be able to take in more data from the human body that you can use to get much better control. We've considered developing like a full bionic hand with individual finger movement, but what we've discovered is that other prosthetics companies that have that they don't have the sensor tech. Mm. So if we put our sensors together with their product, we don't need to build it ourselves. Um, we can still get all of that data and improve the control systems without having to sort of dive into that element. Mm. Um, Vulcan Augmentics is one of the uh, youth-led social enterprises that uh, are advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 10, which is reduce inequality, empower, and promote the inclusion of all. So how are you performing uh, corporate social responsibility? Yeah, we, we, actually, um, we actually are linked to a few of the, the SDG goals, um, no poverty, accessibility to healthcare, partnerships for the goals. Um, and we've worked with UNDP on several projects for this. Uh, a few years ago, we did um, a preliminary fitting for, uh, we did a pilot program to fit some victims of uh, landmines in, um, in the mountains. Uh, but in terms of corporate social responsibility, so our product is already the most affordable prosthetic in the world, but we recognize that even at that price point, not everyone can afford it. Mm. So we take in sponsorships and we work with local large companies with their CSR budgets. Um, the, the simplest way to put it is, you know, we go to a company and we say, if you give us $30,000, we can fit 20 amputees and we'll like hold a big event, give you some PR. And for us, we get 20 new users who like, even if we, even if we lose a little bit of money on actually putting the product on them, it doesn't matter because we have 20 users who are going to be with us for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. And like, 
in the long run, if our product works for them, if it helps them go out and start earning money, then eventually we're gonna earn money too. The average lifetime for a prosthetic hand is about three years. Oh. Um, every three years you have to replace the whole thing. Just take it off, throw it away, get a new one. Okay. But because our product is modular, it's more like in six months you might change your power system. In another eight months you might want an upgrade to your sensor. Another 12 months maybe you want to sort of change the color in the cover. Mm. So instead of replacing the whole thing, they just change it bit by bit by bit. They don't have to spend thousands of dollars like every three years. It can just be whenever they feel like it, they open the app, they press a button, they get an upgrade. I and see. it's something that's a lot more, we think it's a lot more user friendly mm -hmm. than making them, yeah. And if you're someone like, um, say, Ottobock, which is one of the biggest uh, brands in the world, they make really nice stuff, but it's really expensive. Mm -hmm. So they have a product called the Bee Bionic Hand, and mm -hmm. it's probably the most famous, advanced, shiny hand in the world. Mm -hmm. It's about $50,000. Phạm Văn Được lost his arm when he was one year old due to a medical accident. The special treatment he received from teachers and friends always made him feel self-conscious while in school. Được also faced many challenges in crafts and technical subjects. He took much longer to do housework and learn how to drive. At that time, he wanted to get a prosthetic arm. But the hefty price was out of the family's financial capability. He chose to major in information technology at university, partly because jobs in this field do not require using both hands while working, nor do they include a lot of social contacts. But now, Duk is more outgoing and likes to talk to others more because he has a special support device, the Vulcan's robotic arm. Cánh tay vô cần giúp mình tự tin hơn, nổi bật hơn trong một đám đông, hỗ trợ mình trong những công việc hàng ngày như nấu ăn, phơi quần áo, bưng bê những vật dụng, quét dọn nhà cửa, lái xe và đặc biệt giúp mình nhìn ngầu hơn nữa. Đây là mình kiểu giấu đi cái phần tay bị mất nhưng mà khi mà mang tay bây giờ đó là một cái điểm mà Mình muốn người ta chú ý và nhìn vào cái đó là của mình đây là một cái sản phẩm công nghệ. So uh, your company uh, has partnered with different organizations to offer more employment opportunities uh, for amputees. Uh, tell us more about this. Um, sure. So we. We did, we've done projects with um, the coffee house where we looked at designing attachments to help them be waiters and get back into the market there. We also have an agreement with uh, Phoenix, which is a local um, edtech startup. Mm -hmm. They provide free tra IT training for some of our users so that they and uh, connect them to job opportunities so that like, if you've lost your hand in a factory, you probably don't want to go back to the factory. You're probably thinking, maybe I should do something different now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, going into software or coding or graphic design, something like that is, right. is a new opportunity for them to generate income. So yeah, we have a, a few different partners that we work with just to get them back out there. Mm. So like trying to find new jobs for, for, for amputees, um, but it's not like having the jobs in your company for them, right? No, we, we employ, I think it's four amputees at the moment. Um, we've got one of them who is our, yeah, like Vietnam sales lead and UX tester and R&D guy, that's Dirk. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three more who are brand ambassadors and occasional R&D testers. Yeah, um, I wonder uh, who can become free users of your product? Um, anyone who is an amputee, I guess. At, at mm -hmm. the moment, it's targeted for below elbow amputees. Mm -hmm. So if you're a below elbow amputee, then, um, or if you have like a, a congenital deformity here, then you can come to us and we can put you on a list. And the next time we have a, a company that wants to do a CSR project with us, we reach out to you. And if you can actually like travel to the fitting, then you get a free prosthetic. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, speaking of exporting opportunities, uh, which foreign uh, markets are you aiming at now? Um, so this year we actually uh, signed an agreement with a group called Exceed International Clinics. Um, we've done a pilot program in Cambodia. At the end of this year we are doing a pilot program in Singapore with um, SG Naval and, and Tang Tok Seng Hospital. So that's going to be 
very exciting, and uh, India as well. One word that describes Vietnam, I use the Basel way, is chaotic. Probably the most exciting country in Southeast Asia. Vietnam is a place that's very dynamic, so it changes very quickly. This is also a very competitive market. Those are comments of investors in Vietnam. According to the Ministry of Labor Statistics, about 101,550 foreigners are permanent residents in Vietnam. Out of a total population of 100 million, Ho Chi Minh City ranked third in the top best cities for foreigners, according to a survey conducted by Expat City Ranking. Every chance that Vietnam could become a robotics or tech hub of Southeast Asia. would really want to see Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh as a hub regionally with the talent that's on the ground and the growth that's in the domestic market. This can be a regional hub. The amount of change that I've seen and the, the, new, the number of new investors where you start to see Vietnam kind of being discussed more as an outlier to now becoming to be part more of a central discussion as a potential technology hub. And I think that's very exciting. Um, and I'd like to see that trend continue to, uh, to accelerate into the future. Currently, hundreds and thousands of migrants have decided to choose Vietnam as their second home. They come, settle down, and fall in love with this S-shaped country. They find opportunities to develop themselves and contribute to society here. The expat community living in Vietnam is also a high-quality human resource that contributes to and help form a talent network that can support Vietnam's development. So now I want to ask you a, a more kind of bigger picture question mm -hmm. of how uh, is it opening a startup company here in Vietnam? I'd say investors over here are a little bit more conservative. Right. I mean, Silicon Valley, San Francisco is pretty unique in that they are very comfortable with risk. They know what the mass is. They know like that you know only one in 10 of their startups are going to succeed. And they're comfortable with that because they've done the mass and they know that that one success should pay for the rest of their entire right. portfolio if mm. they are good judges. Yeah. But over here, um, <clears throat> it's not just Vietnam, it's sort of broadly, more broadly in the region. Investors are a lot more risk averse and, and conservative. Mm. Mm. Um, fa a company, like a big company failing in the, in the US an investor will be like, oh, well, you know, that's VC, it mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. But over here, that's like a hit on the reputation. And so they're very, very careful where they invest. And it's also why they tend to be a bit more late stage. So just imagine I am your angel investor and uh, I'm interested in your company and I'm asking you, why Vietnam? What's your answer? All right, so why Vietnam? Um, one, it's a, it's a rapidly growing economy. They have a very, very uh, strong um, literacy rate, over 99%. They have a lot of very talented software engineers. Labor costs are a lot lower. You have a very tech savvy population. Um, they have a lot of uh, increasing industrialization and investment in factories, so they're going to be upgrading their skill sets through that. They have trade agreements with multiple countries and organizations, FDA with the EU, CTTP. Um, the language barrier is less so than it would, would be in other countries in the region. Um, There's a lot to tell, right? Yeah, and, and <laughs> also, like, I, I happen to live here for 15 years, so, like, all of the above, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I find it a persuasive. So what do you think about the um, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial uh, spirit of uh, Vietnamese start, staff um, and people? It's incredible. Um, like, Vietnamese hustle. They really do. Um, founders here are, yeah, they're, they, sometimes they can be wildly over-optimistic, but like, I think that's kind of a requirement of being a founder. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think 
Vietnamese are born business people. I mean, one of the one of the examples I see of this is you very rarely see an unemployed grandma or auntie. Like mm -hmm. all of the houses, all of the houses in Vietnam, you've got the the bottom floor, which is just that sort of open roller uh, blind, and then all the family lives above. And if sort of the parents are out there working every day, you can bet that downstairs grandma's going to have her own little shop. Mm -hmm. And it's I think it's just yeah in their blood. It's something for them to do almost. Mm -hmm. Like I think if if Vietnamese could Vietnamese people could retire and just do absolutely nothing. I think a lot of them would go stir crazy. I think they they like they want to be interacting. They want to be doing things. Mm -hmm. And I also think that that's something that is um, actually much stronger than I see in the UK. Like in the UK, old people they don't tend to stay with their families and they tend to go into homes. And over here, they stay a lot more active. They stay a lot more useful to the family. They're taking care of the kids. Like if they don't live in the house, then they'll live very close or next door. And I think. That community element also enables a lot of smaller scale business that you would not see in um, well, the UK, where I'm from. Yeah. So, what do you think of the potential of uh, you know wearable uh, products in the medtech um, you know uh, sector here and uh, uh, the potential of that sector? Huge, absolutely huge. Um, I mean, people are increasingly putting technology onto their bodies, and it's whether it's medical or not. I mean, you've got VR and AR, you've got um, like pharmaceutical trials, you've got uh, exoskeletons. I mean, Ford and Hitachi, they are using their the exosuits for their factory workers. Um, you have wellness monitoring, so like uh, for, for a lot of um, rehabilitation for stroke or paralysis patients, mm. they don't really want to travel backwards and forwards to the hospital, but with some good sensor technology and an iPad, your doctor can talk to you online. He can actually take readings from your body in real time, make recommendations for treatment. Um, I think I have my last question uh, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, to you. Um, I know that during COVID time, uh, your startup, your company was facing many difficulties, but what kept you persistent on, you know, moving forward and um, um, carrying well, I'd say production? That a lot of companies had difficulties, uh, but what kept me moving forward is, is the same thing that keeps me moving forward now, which is that um, because I know this idea will work. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much um, for sharing with us um, today, uh, and uh, we wish thank you, you for having me. We wish you all the best um, for your startup here in Vietnam, and many more years to uh, stay here and contribute more to the amputees community. Yeah, let's make Vietnam a global brand. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. The determination and persistence to overcome obstacles to fulfill a need of society is the message we want to convey here. Iron Man usually has iron will, so we wish Vulcan Augmentics, originally started with the name Iron Man, will always keep the iron will to continue on the arduous but exciting path of a startup. And hopefully in Vietnam and with Vietnamese intellectuals, they will achieve their ultimate goal, which is providing a solution for people with disabilities so that the loss of a person's body part is just inconvenience, but not unhappiness. And that's it for Talk Vietnam. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you again next time.